Welcome to the Profit Triangle Part 3. Very excited to be here for this presentation, as with all the presentations. These are a lot of fun. They're exciting, but they're, they also create a lot of challenges because we're really trying to tackle some of the most important principles of the restored gospel, and they all have so many principles that go into it. It's really, really hard to do it linearly. So we're going to go ahead and, and launch right into this, knowing that we're going to introduce a number of uh, principles that we're also going to be talking about later quite a bit. So these are sort of the introduction of these. And today in this presentation, we're going to have McKay back with us. That was in the, our last uh, profit discussion. And McKay, really excited to have you back here with us today. Yeah, I'm excited to be back, Todd. Thanks for having me. This is going to be a good conversation. I hope you jump in, ask questions where you feel they should be asked. And I'm excited to give this to you because, you know, you and I have talked quite a bit about you being a seminary teacher and some of the most important conversations and questions are being brought up from the youth. So hopefully yeah. some of these discussions will be, be beneficial for, for our young, powerful friends who are being, um, who are asking them and, and uh, really having to learn a lot right now. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, and I, I use this, I use kind of whatever, whatever I can, I can learn. I, I have found that I have looked at the, the gospel through a lens of how can this help the youth and I think our conversation, you know, last time and, and the conversation that you had on, on the first part, I think has, has done, done great with, with those so far. And so I'm excited. I'm excited to keep going. Well, good, because, you know, the intent of this is to produce faith, to increase faith in Jesus Christ, in his restored gospel, and in the principle of prophets and apostles. So, you know, because we're looking at this from a different angle and we're, and we're bringing in different principles here, it might be easy to maybe think that we are, um, we're introducing something that would undermine faith. And I believe it's exactly the opposite. And as we conclude and go through this, this multi-part beginning series about prophets, if people don't walk away from this feeling more committed to sustaining the church and the covenant, then we failed. We failed drastically. And so... I really do hope that the listener will open their hearts and bear with us for the entire duration of all of these, because what we're doing is we're driving towards the truth and truth is always better. It never disappoints. And we draw some very, very important distinctions and we draw yeah, hopefully light into some principles that we will all come away stronger, more faithful members of Christ's church and more faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. So that's where we're driving towards. So let's Love jump it. in. Let's see if I can get it to work. There we go. The profit triangle. Once again, we're, we're dealing with concepts that are okay, that help us understand and to maybe contextualize true principles. But if we don't move past them, those concepts oftentimes become big stumbling blocks. And within the profit triangle, we've already talked about this quite a bit. There are a number of them. And so in this third presentation, we're going to jump into one of the best ones, I think. And that is the question of profit versus president. And the reason why this is so important is because there's probably no bigger conflation in the gospel, in the church, than the concept of a prophet versus the president of the church. And for good reason. So and we're going to, and we're going to explore why, but we're going to talk about the principle of prophets and the principle of the president of the church and why they're conflated oftentimes and why they should not be conflated oftentimes. And I think that as we understand that more and more, we're going to start to understand why there's so many questions of faith. There's so many um, faith crises around this. This is probably perhaps one of the biggest places that we can identify where people have trouble or struggle in the gospel and in the church. So hopefully as we lay these things out, we're going to lay a foundation to really work through difficult church history and difficult doctrinal questions. So 
that's the intent. It might be too ambitious, but let's go for it. So shattering triangles, profit versus president. And is there a difference? And I'm assuming that maybe the listener probably assumes that, yeah, there is a difference because we're raising the question. And the difference is very, very important that we understand both of these principles, because if we don't, we're going to make some really, really critical mistakes. So let's talk about who is the president of the church and what is the doctrine or the principle of the president? And this is, to me, this is an exhilarating principle, McKay, because once we understand more and more how this critical, critical role is established, is called, and how we sustain the president, to me, this will increase much more faith than perhaps a traditional um, conceptualization of this principle. So the president of the church is called the president because he's the president of the high priesthood of the church. And we get this from DNC 107, and 107 is a really, really important uh, section that we're going to be relying on a lot because it's it's one of the fundamental priesthood sections that Joseph Smith gets that he reveals the principles of priesthood and priesthood government. So in 107.65, we're told, wherefore it must needs be that one be appointed of the high priesthood to preside over the priesthood, and he shall be called president of the high priesthood of the church. Now notice that it uses the word appointed, and I should have underlined it, but I didn't. Uh, this is going to be one of the critical things that we're going to talk about, about how the president of the, of the church is actually called and why and, and what that means. So the president is the president of the high priesthood of the church, or in other words, the presiding high priest over the high priesthood of the church. That creates a mouthful of words, so we're going to shorten it. And we're going to call him the presiding high priest. In 107, it teaches us, and again, by duty of the president of the office of the high priesthood is to preside over the whole church and to be like unto Moses. Behold, here is wisdom, yea, to be a seer, a revelator, a translator, a prophet, having all the gifts of God, which he bestows upon the head of the church. Now. If this is not an important verse, I don't know what is, but it's going to require some unpacking and some, and some thought for us to draw all the pertinent and important principles out of this. So things like presiding over the whole church, we're going to talk about that in a future presentation, what it means to preside. Uh, but to be likened to Moses, we're already hearkening back to something we talked about in a previous um, uh, video which is, is what exactly was Moses up to? What was he doing? What was he charged with? And then we're going to talk about what it means to be a seer, revelator, a translator, and a prophet, that they're gifts of God. So let's keep moving. Later in 107, it says this, and we're kind of doing a quick tour because we're going to connect all these things together. Wherefore, now let every man learn his duty. Now, this is something we don't want to run over fast because the, 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 the use of the term duty is very, very important. And to act in the office in which he is appointed in all diligence. He that is slothful shall not, shall not be counted worthy to stand. And he that learns not his duty and shows himself not approved shall not be counted worthy to stand. Even so, amen. Why we're pointing this out is because the president of the church has a duty to become a prophet, a seer, and a revelator. Those gifts are not automatically bestowed by virtue of his appointment to that office. And like we've talked about before, a prophet is a gift, or being a prophet is a gift of God. It is not an office in the church. It's not a church office. So is there a priesthood office called prophet? Kind of got, got ahead of myself a little bit. And the answer is no. And this might be kind of an odd thing for somebody encountering this principle for the first time to kind of consider, but it's actually really, really important. 
there's no such thing as a priesthood office called prophet. But there's an extremely important priesthood office called the presiding high priest. And that's who the president of the church is. That's who President Nelson is. Does that mean President Nelson's not a prophet? I'm not saying that at all. But I'm just saying that you're not called to the office of a prophet. You're called to the office of the presiding high priest who has the duty to become a prophet. And that's part of what he's charged with in that role. Same with um, the apostleship. So let's go back to this. And any, any, you know, McKay, at any time, you know, if you feel like any of these principles, we're kind of going fast through this. Um, uh, does this resonate with you? Does this well uh, stick out that you'd like to jump in on? See, I was actually just about to, I, because, so go, what was, what was the one where it talks about, let's see, becoming like, okay, there it is. It's right in front of my face. Um, be like unto Moses. So <clears throat> I guess my my overall question on this part of it, you know, we're obviously when when we're when we're looking at stuff like this, we're thinking about um, President Nelson, right? Who's uh -huh. who is yeah. the current the current president, the current presiding high priest of of the church. Now, <clears throat> oh, the the what's what was the scripture that you just showed where it talks about? Um, they have they have this duty and if they don't goodness why am i why am i losing this right yeah, here there's a consequence if you don't perform the duty that's given to you right so, yeah that's so, right so then and this is this might be getting ahead of things right here would there then be because connecting these dots right if they don't fulfill that would there then be reason to would it be reasonable then to say, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that, you know, the whole preamble, and we're getting into some other things here, to, to official declaration one where uh, President Woodruff said that if, you know, if I do anything that lead, would lead the church astray, then I would be basically, you know, I'd be killed by God, would, was the gist of what yeah, he he'd said. He'd be removed, yeah. He'd be removed from his eye. How does a prophet get removed, right? So, um, or the president of the church get removed, right? Um so I guess if, if the president of the church is not doing their duty, then there are consequences. What, what are the, what are those consequences? Okay, so I guess? It's, a, there, it's a more? really, yeah, it's a great, great question. And we're going to get to a lot of those. We're going to, we're actually going to talk about. Um, and that's what I figured. I, no, I I'm, glad I'm glad you're bringing, bringing it up because stuff, but. it's going to be in the, yeah, I'm really glad you're bringing it up because it's going to be in people's minds when they hear this. And so we're going to actually talk all about that. But just to get in front of it a little bit, you know, it's not necessarily a binary thing. Is he it or is he not? Uh, there's going to be a spectrum of, of anybody who's at the president of the church and fulfilling their calling. And we have to understand that we have to extend a lot of grace, a lot of mercy, and the way we sustain the president of the church should be informed by the fact that we should understand how heavy the burden is that he carries and the responsibility he carries. So we're going to talk about sustaining him and blessing him and helping him fulfill that duty, which is really, really important. He can have a tremendous blessing upon the covenant people through this, through this role. And, and there's also, on the other side of that, some very, very important things that we need to understand about the responsibility of the members of the covenant to appoint and to discern their head. And that's, that's, it's a two-edged sword all the time. And we're going to talk about that because that's an aspect of this that's rarely, rarely, if ever, I'm going to say never, discussed. And it's really mm -hmm. critical for us in order to sustain the presence of the church to be fully aware of his duty and fully aware of ours so that we can make a full accounting to the Lord. So I'm glad you brought it up. We are going to talk about it at length, um, but let's build to it. How's that sound? Okay, sounds great, sounds great. Okay, so the presiding high priest is to be likened to Moses. And so what was Moses? And Moses was a number of things. The first thing we have already talked about is that 
Moses sought to make a nation of prophets. And what our modern version of that would be is a church of prophets or a covenant people of prophets. In other words, as Moses sought to bring the children of Israel up the mount and into the presence of the Lord while in the flesh, so is it the role or the duty of the presiding high priest to also obtain that relationship with the Lord, to be a pattern and to give laws and guidance so that the entire church can also ascend and have that marvelous and great blessing. That's the meaning of the fullness of the gospel, which of course, we'll talk a lot about in future presentations. So he sought to bring Israel into the presence of the Lord. This is the DNC 84 reminder. We've already gone through this. Now this Moses plainly taught to the children of Israel in the wilderness and sought diligently to sanctify his people that they might behold the face of God. The presiding high priest has this ever-present duty to do the same thing. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. Started with Joseph. Joseph was very explicit about it and worked very, very hard. In fact, one could argue that it was the heartbeat of his ministry was to do precisely this. Moses also, oh, I'm sorry. Let me jump into this real quick. I got a little bit ahead of myself. This is Brigham Young. And Brigham Young, is, as the presiding high priest of the church, made this comment. And this should kind of probably give us some context of, of faithfully executing this office because it's not necessarily easy or nor should we assume that the presiding high priest is in that structure where he's in the presence of the Lord because, uh, because of his calling. It's a duty he is supposed to have um, and that he is supposed to uh, fulfill. Brigham Young says, I have flattered myself if I am as faithful as I know how to be to my God and my brethren and to all my covenants and faithful in the discharge of my duty. See, interesting how these words will consistently come up. When I have lived to be as old as was Moses when the Lord appeared to him, that perhaps I then may hold communion with the Lord, as did Moses. And it was believed that Moses spoke to God at the age of 80. I am not now in that position though I know much more than I did 20, 10, or five years ago. If I am faithful until I am 80 years of age, perhaps the Lord will appear to me and personally dictate me in the management of his church and people. Now, McKay, let's make some really clear points here real fast. If the president of the church has not been in the, in the, in the presence of the Lord, does that invalidate him as the presiding high priest? And I would say absolutely not, that, that the president of the church is called to do something really, really great, and it has a lot to do with how we appoint them, but just because they're not in the presence of the Lord, it doesn't mean that they're invalidated, and we're going to unpack that a lot in future presentations. So I'm not making a case as many people do, that just because the prophet or the president of the church hasn't seen the Lord and isn't declaring that witness, that he is not the authorized presiding high priest of the church and is not worthy of our sustaining. Quite the opposite. We sustain them so that they can fulfill these critical roles. And that's important to understand. Does that make sense? And I love that. And I was just about to jump in on this part too, because um, I've seen multiple comments as I'm sure you have seen some, some of the same ilk of people who say uh, something along the lines of, well, I can't believe, and these, these are people who've left the church. I can't believe I thought that these men saw God. And I have to say, I'm like, well, what, what made you think that? And I think it's a, it's a very, Again, it's a it's a it's a triangle, right? And not, maybe not even a, a triangle. It's just a it's just a cultural belief that is a lot more as as you're showing here. It it can be a lot more damaging to faith than it can be strengthening. That's right. Um, because over so, the generations, many many leaders have allowed this type of assumption to go forth without being really mm -hmm. really clear about the principle. So, like you said, it's a triangle. So let's let's break this triangle. Um, 
two, two of them right here. One is, is that no, it's not true that if you're an apostle or the, or the presiding high priest of the church, that you are de facto in the presence of the Lord. That's not true. And two, if you're not, it doesn't mean you're invalidated. So we have to be clear about both triangles that we sort of bump up against almost immediately. So what is a prophet versus the presiding high priest? Now, we talked a lot about what a prophet is already. So if the listener has not listened to those other presentations, please go back because we don't, we don't have the time or ability to go back and restructure the, the discussion. But it's really critical to understand the difference between the presiding high priest and, the, and a prophet, even though a presiding high priest is called to be a prophet. So we get a lot of this from DNC section 28 and also section 42, but we're going to unpack uh, 28 um, to a certain degree today. So it is true. There is only one presiding high priest on the earth today. That is where, where we get this triangle that there's only one prophet on the earth. And that's because we conflate these terms prophet and high priest too much. And it, conf it confuses and it muddies the water. So it is true that on the earth, there is only one presiding high priest and for good reason. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, when it comes to prophets, there are many on the earth for good reason. And there's going to be some really important principles between these two things that we're going to have to, we're going to, have to draw a lot of light on. Well, and, and just real quick, Todd, if, yeah. I can, if I can hop in on this. Now, I think if you were to show this to a lot of people, right away i think they're agreeing and they're saying well yeah there's 15 so yeah let's let's go back sure, i know yeah. you've addressed this before but just make sure to be clear that that many is is also not limited to the 15 men who are the first presidency in the form of the 12 apostles, oh 100 percent. in fact everybody yeah. should be a prophet there's prophets for a very for a lot of different dimensions and we talked about this a little bit already but um yeah are the apostles also called to be prophets here and revelators 100% because for them to fulfill their calling, they need to have those gifts in order to fulfill those calls. So it's not a, those offices are not the office of prophet, seer, and revelator. They're the office of apostleship. And in order to be an apostle, you must obtain the gifts of prophet, seer, and revelator. So section 28, Joseph Smith is giving this section uh, to Oliver Cowdery. It's about Hiram Page and the Hiram Page incident. And Hiram Page, as a lot, most people will know, probably listening to this, um, shortly after the, the organization of the church in April of 1830, Hiram Page, who was one of the, one of the um, witnesses of the, of the plates uh, in the Book of Mormon, uh, produced a seer stone and produced revelations from that seer stone that looked a lot like and felt like and tasted like the ones that joseph smith was also producing for the church and he was getting what we believe were revelations about how to govern the church and for the government of the church and that's some these are some terms that are going to be really important for us to understand uh so that we understand what section 28 is really saying to us because section 28 is drawn out quite a bit. And we're going to, we're going to kind of talk about why, and it's really, really critical section. So, but behold, verily, verily, I say unto thee, no one shall be appointed to receive commandments and revelations in this church, excepting my servant, Joseph Smith, Jr. For he receiveth them even as Moses. Now notice how Moses keeps coming up. Isn't that interesting? Like this is not like planned. <laughs> It's just the principle. So what was Moses doing? Moses was a lawgiver to the church. He, you know, he received the law of Moses. He received binding covenants and binding commandments upon covenant Israel or the covenant people. So in section 28, when it says, he, no one shall be appointed to receive commandments and revelations in this church, it doesn't mean that people can't get revelations. And even revelations that have to do with things that would like regarding the uh, the the world and things outside their family, some things outside what we often consider, you know, their stewardship, so to speak. That you can get revelations 
uh, understanding regarding everything that the Lord would give anybody except revelations regarding the the uh, direction that the church needs to go into that would be binding upon the church or commandments that would be binding upon the church. And those are the types of commandments and revelations that we put into scripture because they're, you know, they're produced, they're presented to the church by common consent. They get voted on, agreed upon by the covenant people, and those go in. And those are the types of things that presumably Hiram Page was, was, um, was producing. And, you know, there were quite a few people who were persuaded by Hiram Page and Joseph Smith um, was very, very concerned, rightfully, and got this revelation explaining that it is the duty of the presiding high priest of the church that all revelations or commandments that are binding upon the church itself come through one single channel. And there's really important reasons for that. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with stewardship, keys, and accountability. So that is the first thing that we're going to lay out. We could talk about that a lot longer, and maybe we'll actually have a video dedicated just to this, but that's the principle. So he tells Oliver, and remember, Oliver is not the president of the church, but he says to him, and if thou, Oliver, are led at any time by the comforter to speak or teach, or at, at all times by way of commandment unto the church, thou mayest do it. But thou shalt not write by way of commandment, but by way of wisdom. And he makes this distinction of wisdom versus commandment. So the presiding high priest has the power and the responsibility and the key and the stewardship to produce commandments that are binding upon the covenant people. Everyone else, including prophets like apostles and those who are perhaps called to speak in church, can speak by the power of the gift of the Holy Ghost, but it's the principle of wisdom. And that's the distinction that we need to make. And it's really, really critical. And so we're going to kind of draw this out more. The presiding high priest has a unique and singular um, responsibility and stewardship to manage the scriptural record. Prophets, even though they speak by the power and authority of the Holy Ghost, does not mean if you're a prophet that you have the right to go and amend the scriptural record. In fact, very much only one person has that responsibility, and that's the presiding high priest. And this is where we get the Samuel Lamanite example, which probably draws this out better than any other example we have in modern scripture. The presiding high priest operates under a priesthood covenant, which is which is very, very important. We're going to talk about that. Prophets declare the word as the Lord puts them in their hearts, and it's the gift of the Holy Ghost that gives a prophet authority, and that gift of the Holy Ghost is the primary authority of the Lord, and we're, we're going to, I know I keep saying this, but we're also going to be developing that and explaining that the Holy Ghost is the authority of God. So let's talk about Samuel Lamanite, Lamanite real quick. Hopefully the listener is already pretty familiar with, with uh, the story in the Book of Mormon, but let's read real fast. But behold, the voice of the Lord came unto him that he should return again, that's Samuel, and prophesy unto the people whatsoever thing should come into his heart. Now, was Samuel part of the priesthood, ordained priesthood structure of the Nephite nation? Uh, no, he was not. But the Lord put it in his heart anyways to prophesy unto the people. And it came to pass that they would not suffer that he should enter into the city. Therefore, he went and got upon the wall thereof and stretched forth his hand and cried with a loud voice and prophesied unto the people whatsoever things the Lord put into his heart. Now, remember, this is a time that Nephi, who has the covenantal stewardship, is on the land. And Samuel the Lamanite is still told to go amongst the people and to prophesy the things in his heart. Now, this is what makes it even more interesting. We jump a bunch of years later, Christ is visiting the Nephites and he's, we have this record and it's beautiful and it's amazing. Let's read from it. And now it came to pass that when Jesus had said these words, he said unto them again, after he had expounded all the scriptures unto them which they had received. Now, isn't it interesting how Christ 
is expounding their scriptures to them. He said unto them, Behold, other scriptures I would that ye should write that ye have not. And it came to pass that he said unto Nephi, Bring forth the record which ye have kept. And when Nephi had brought forth the records and laid them before him, he cast his eyes upon them and said, Verily I say unto you, I commanded my servant Samuel the Lamanite, that he should testify unto this people, that at the day that the Father should glorify his name in me, that there were many saints who should arise from the dead and should appear unto many and should minister unto them. And he said unto them, Was it not so? So he's saying to them, Did I not send Samuel to you as he's checking their scriptures? And his disciples answered him and said, Yea, Lord, Samuel did prophesy according to thy words, and they were all fulfilled. And Jesus said unto them, How be it that ye have not written this thing, that many saints did arise and appear unto many and did minister unto them? And it came to pass that Nephi remembered that this thing had not been written. And it came to pass that Jesus commanded that it should be written, therefore it was written according as he commanded. And now it came to pass that when Jesus had expounded all the scriptures in one which they had written, he commanded them that they should teach the things which he had expounded unto them. So Christ corrects the scriptural record. Samuel was a prophet. He delivered the word of the Lord that he put in his heart, and it was Nephi's covenantal responsibility to maintain the scriptural record. Isn't this a great example of how these two principles are to interplay. So one can deduce, and I think deduce at a high level of confidence, that it's not doesn't mean that the president of the church is the only one that gets revelations. It's the responsibility of the president of the church to determine, to discern, and to give those revelations to the church as he fulfills his responsibility as the presiding high priest. So I don't want to read these, but I'm going to show you very quickly how many times in the Book of Mormon it references many prophets that are concurrent, that are at the same time. Um, and so we don't have time to go through all these. We don't, we don't need to, but it's really, really interesting. So Ether 11, there's many prophets that prophesied a destruction. And... Um, and it's very interesting here also before I go on that. They prophesied of the destruction of that great people, except they should repent and turn to the Lord and forsake their murders and wickedness. Okay, I'm not going to move forward. That. That's actually a typo. Um, the next one is in Ether 7. There came prophets among the people, prophesying of the wickedness and idolatry of the people and bringing a curse on the land and then declaring repentance. Helaman 13, uh, talking about woe unto the people that, they did cast out the prophets and mock and stone them and slayed them. And Jerem came to pass that the prophets of the Lord did threaten the people of Nephi according to the word of God, that they should keep the commandments. So the Lord's sending many, many prophets to them. First Nephi 1 4, um, the beginning of the Book of Mormon in, in uh, Jerusalem. My father Lehi dwelt in the well, at Jerusalem all his days, and in that same year, there came many prophets prophesying into the people. A lot of times people will say that's, you know, that was Jeremiah's stewardship, but Jeremiah was one of many prophets. Ether 9, there came many prophets in the land again, crying repentance unto them. There are Nephi 6.25. There came a complaint against came up unto the land of Zarahemla to the governor of the land against these judges who had condemned the prophets of the Lord unto death, not according to the law. So they're killing prophets, which is also a principle, by the way, we're going to talk about later of that. The more powerful, well, never mind. Prophets, prophets get persecuted. Now behold, there was not a living soul among the people of Nephi who did doubt in the least the words of all the holy prophets who had spoken, for they knew that it must needs be, must be fulfilled. Alma 37, for behold, they murdered all the prophets of the Lord who came among them to declare them concerning their iniquities. See a pattern here, McKay? <laughs> a little bit, over just a little over bit. And over yeah. and over again. That is the principle that the Lord will send many prophets. Enos 122, exceedingly, exceedingly many prophets among us 
And remember, this is uh, this is during Jacob and Enos, right? But this is Jacob. But Lamoni said unto him, I will not slay Ammon, for I know they are just men and holy prophets of the true God. So talking about Ammon and his brothers. Now is the custom among all the Nephites to appoint for their chief captains, someone that had the spirit of revelation and also prophecy. Therefore, this Gideon, uh, I can't pronounce his name, was a great prophet among them, as also was the chief judge. And so referencing the fact that they appoint people who had the spirit of revelation and prophecy, these gifts, again, assigning the gift, not um, priesthood office. Finally, words of Mormon 1.17. I love this one. But behold, King Benjamin was a holy man, and he did reign over his people in righteousness. I mean, King Benjamin's arguably one of the most powerful prophet kings in the Book of Mormon. But it says, and there were many holy men in the land, and they did speak the word of God with power and with authority, and they did use much sharpness because of the sick neckedness of the people. So it doesn't matter if, if the presiding high priest or the king or the, the person that has the covenant responsibility for scripture and for the priesthood governance is righteous, they, the Lord often sends many people for his purposes. So a, a natural place that we're going to get into now is the question of priesthood keys, because Understanding priesthood keys as a unique doctrinal concept that we talk about in this last dispensation is going to be something that's very, very important that we drive a lot of clarity into. And we're going to introduce the idea, not the idea, the principle here. But McKay, understand that this is, this is going to have an entire presentation dedicated to it later as we build out more. But we're going to start to introduce the principle of priesthood keys now. And we're going to do that just through a couple, a uh, few concepts, okay? So what priesthood keys mean a number of different things. Um, it's really important that we don't boil it just to one simplified, oversimplified idea or concept. But but we let's let's lay out a few of them first, okay? Priesthood keys are covenantal stewardship. So if someone's given a key over something, oftentimes or sometimes that key means that they are given a stewardship, that they have a covenant that they have to answer for. Keys also are principles of knowledge. And we don't usually use that term very often in this way, but it's critical because Joseph Smith almost always used it this way. Like the vast majority of times that Joseph Smith uses the term keys, he's actually talking about knowledge. And there's a lot to unpack with that, but that's a critical, critical thing we need to start outlining. And finally, the idea of patterns. And this is going to make more sense when we talk about priesthood orders, but keys are also the patterns which we, um, we receive and follow. So let's kind of start with covenantal stewardship in a way. Um, the covenantal stewardship is the presiding high priest. So some of those stewardships are like the gathering of Israel. So it doesn't matter what kind of revelations you get, what kind of broad things the Lord shows you. There's only one single person that is going to get revelation on how to conduct the gathering of Israel in terms of what the entire church is supposed to be doing. And they have to answer for that stewardship. Presiding over the church is a covenantal stewardship. And we're going to talk about presiding. And being a lawgiver like Moses was. And so this goes back to that DNC 28, that getting binding commandments and revelations for the church is the same as being a lawgiver like Moses. So we doing okay so far, McKay? Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm super, following you. Super important. This is why the presiding high priest, just because we're separating out this idea of prophet and presiding high priest does not mean we're undermining the president of the church. His priesthood role is so important it's so critical but we need to understand with precision how and why so we can sustain him in the right way okay now dnc 42 is the other section besides dnc 28 that we get insight into 
the roles and responsibilities of the president of the church. And this is very similar to, to DNC 28, actually, but it's, and it's important that we bring it up. So we're going to read this fairly quickly. Behold, verily, I say unto you that ye have received a commandment for a law unto my church through him whom I have appointed unto you to receive commandments and revelations from my hand. That's in the same principle of binding revelations, binding commandments. And this you shall know assuredly, that there is none other appointed unto you to receive commandments and revelations until he be taken, if he abide in me. So that's, that is going to speak to the agency or the, the, the probationary stewardship of the presiding high priest that we're going to talk about momentarily. But verily, verily, I say unto you that none else shall be appointed unto this gift, except it be through him. For it be taken from him, he shall not have power except to appoint another in his stead. And this shall be a law unto you, that ye receive not the teachings of any that shall come before you as revelations or commandments. This is critical. So no one can produce a revelation or a commandment that's binding on the church except for the president of the church. Now, other people can receive them and the president of the church administers them, but it comes through that channel. It comes through that gate. And that is really really important. Now, within the confines of revealed scriptural prophetic knowledge, people can do, people can talk about, teach about, expound on. There is many, 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 many scriptures that command us to teach one another the doctrines of the kingdom. But in terms of receiving new revelations and new commandments that are binding upon covenant body of the church they only come through the channel of the presiding high priest here is a great example of this now a lot of people are really really familiar with this heber c kimball prophecy and for good reason it's very very powerful heber c kimball says i want to say to you my brother and the time is coming when we will be mixed up in these now peaceful valleys to the, that extent that it will be difficult to tell the face of a saint from the face of an enemy to the people of God. Then, brethren, look out for the great sieve, for there will be a great sifting time, and many will fa fall. For I say unto you, there is a test, a test, a test coming, and who will be able to stand? So, McKay, have you heard this prophecy before? A test is coming to these hills? No. <laughs> you never heard this, really? I've never heard this. Nope. Well, I'm yeah. glad to be, uh, it's an honor to be the one that introduced uh, you to this, <laughs> this great prophecy. I'm learning here, man. I, and that's why I'm just, and honestly, I'm just, I'm kind of, as the kids would say, I'm just letting you cook here because uh, I'm, I'm learning a ton. And, and so anyway, well, yeah, can continue. I bring this up because it's a pretty, pretty well common one. And it's quoted a lot. So this is, this is who's quoted this in general conference. President, President Lee, President Hinckley, President Benson, and Elder Quentin Cook more recently. Now, why am I even bringing this up? Well, it's because Heber C. Kimball was never president of the church. This is an example of somebody who is an apostle who received an incredible prophecy. In fact, Brigham Young used to say, Heber C. Kimball is my prophet. And you have multiple presidents of the church quoting this in general conference talks. Well, if, if it's the case that somebody can't get a revelation for the whole church, that, that's, that would never happen. That's just demonstrably untrue with many, many, many examples. What is true, though, is that Heber C. Kimball can't demand or command, you know, Brigham Young or, or um, Joseph Smith, he would have got this during Brigham Young, to put this into the scriptural record and make it binding on the church. But you see that many presidents of the church quote this because it's fundamentally true. Interesting, huh? That's super interesting. And I just, I just want to like, this is, this needs to be for, for the listener. This needs to be more freeing to, to give you more. And, and it gives me more certainly, um, more hope that there is more autonomy and more agency involved in getting revelation than the triangle that we've been taught either implicitly or explicitly uh, in the church that, well, 
here's here's where you can get revelation and it basically boils down to where can you live and who can you marry and outside of that you can't get anything else that's going to be the job of the church well boy doesn't that just limit our agency doesn't oh, yeah. doesn't that just just say well you know you can't you you ought not to be trying to get the mysteries of of god even though as you said i mean we're encouraged to try and and get those and to get revelations and and it's just it's so much this principle is so much more freeing to me than than what is again both implicitly and explicitly taught in the church that hey you marriage and and maybe where you can live or and that's about the extent of where where your revelation goes yeah but that's, like you that's said so not true. it should be really really expanding our understanding of what both what's available and what's our actual duty as individuals in the kingdom and i keep saying this over and over, i'm sure it's just getting annoying but these will be things that we'll talk about um and to that point also when you say it's our responsibility or duty or what is critical, though, with that is that we understand all the principles that go into that hamake, because if you oh, yeah. have revelatory um, gifts and you pursue those things, then understanding all the principles that govern those gifts are incredibly important because the, the risk of, de of deception is always extremely high. So mm. um, those, those are very, very important to understand and explore. Um, but back to priesthood keys, when we teach by wisdom or we speak by wisdom, you know, like even president Oaks, when he speaks in general conference, it's under the principle of wisdom and not commandment, like, um, binding on the church. That's just in, in the same way that, um, DNC 28 instructs, well, he can speak by commandment, but it's the principle of wisdom and not being um, it's not binding upon Israel unless it comes through the president, even President Oaks or Elder or Elder Irene, President Irene. Wisdom, the principle of wisdom is is wonderful because it brings light and truth. And it brings light and truth always within the confines or the structure of revealed truth that's current. That if that makes sense. So, but it's pretty important we understand how broad that actually could be because of the vastness of our present scriptural record and the vastness of teachings of prophets, like even like Brigham Young and Joseph Smith that we, that we have available to us. It's, it's really remarkable. So wisdom brings light and truth. Sorry, I clicked that early. I kind of hit it too, too soon. So let's think about speaking by wisdom and bringing light and truth. Okay. So when you listen to the general conference and you hear like a president Oak speak, or you hear, the general young men's president or the general release society president or the general, you know, young women's president, they are speaking under this principle of wisdom. Those are not binding commandments on the church. Those are not binding revelations. They're extraordinarily powerful. Truth is emitted, but there's a distinction between that because only the president of the church can do that sort of thing. Okay, does that make sense? But just by just be calling it wisdom and not binding does not mean that it is in this subcategory that's way far from binding revelations. In fact, I want to speak out of turn here, but I don't think we've had a binding revelation or a binding commandment on the church. Well, in probably for like 150 years, we have the. I was going to ask that. I was going to yeah. ask. Well, especially with like giving laws. And and binding stuff on the church, yeah. I was gonna ask. I, I I don't remember it in my lifetime. And again, correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah, where where you just said that, I'm like, okay, well, good. I'm well, I'm glad even, that. Um, well, yeah, even like the revelation on the priesthood and in um, that all worthy members could have it. That even that we didn't actually receive the revelation. The revelation has never been introduced to the church. Um, it was the declaration of it that has been given. And declarations are not scriptural. They're just declarations of what we're gonna do. So it, um, it's an interesting thing to kind of parse out. I'm not undermining it. It's it's obviously it's obviously true, but even that's not a revelation. Um, they apparently did receive a revelation, but that revelation they received was never presented to the church for acceptance. So CES, whenever CES, that's you, McKay. Hey, 
uh, you're not, you're not operating under a priesthood key when you teach seminary in the mornings, right. Or seminary during the day. Dang it. Um, you know, sorry, man. Sorry to tell you that, but, uh, oh, you man. operate under this principle of, of wisdom and bringing light and truth within the bounds of, of, um, the gospel of Jesus Christ as revealed education week's the same people flock to education week, uh, same thing. So people are antsy about not listening to the prophet. Well, this is, this is what this means. This is, <laughs> this is the, <laughs> this is the body of the sources that we go to for inspiration, light and truth and, and edification. Right. So um, are you yeah. saying that, that seminary is on the same level of general conference? Should I go tell my students that? Look, general, yeah, right. You know, the principle here is, and we, and, and this takes more time to probably build out, but the principle here is, is that the Holy Ghost is the minister of truth and the authoritative aspect of all truth. Mm. And that probably takes more explaining to do in regards to those who have priesthood keys. But even with those who have priesthood keys, if they don't speak within the confines and bounds of the Holy Ghost, they do not have authority. Um, that is not authoritative. And so the Holy Ghost, if, if you are speaking in the right, in the right, um, if you're speaking lawfully as a, CE, as a CES teacher or in general conference or education week, and the Holy Ghost attends your words, that's what brings binding power and authority of heaven upon them. It's just that those words are not being given in scripture as new scripture binding upon right. them, my, on the church, the covenant, the covenant body. So hopefully that, that difference makes sense. We might have to do another video to even make like make this more clear, but hopefully this is coming out in a in a clear way. BYU religion yeah. department is the same. You know, people look at them as as authoritative, and to the degree that they have true knowledge in the light of truth and by the Holy Ghost, yeah, it is authoritative in in the, in the conditions of the Holy Ghost, one hundred percent. But BYU religion department is not producing new revelations for the scriptures to be entered into. Fair Latter Day Saints is is one of a handful of 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 websites people go to that the church, uh, you know, says they're not affiliated with, but people feel like they're responsible enough to to sort of represent the church's views. But one hundred percent has no authority, no keys to talk to speak, and so they also work in the same dimension. Uh, people like the Joseph Smith Foundation, you know. Um, I don't always agree with them. In fact, there's a lot I don't agree with those folks over there, but I think they operate in good faith. They're doing their best out there. They have zero authority in the sense of like keys to do what they're doing, but they work in wisdom and bring light and truth. Blogs. Uh, there's millions of those out there. You know, people who like to present things like near-death experiences, those are going to be extraordinarily faith-promoting, spirit-enhancing. And if someone has a near-death experience, and the Lord says, you know, give testimony and give witness of this. That is 100% within the realm of, of, of the pattern, both ancient and modern, of what can be done in terms of bearing witness to the world and to the church of a testimony over witness of something. Especially if they're saying that it's not binding upon the church, which I've never seen anybody do. And Deseret Book. And Deseret Book is the, my, probably my favorite example of all this because think of all the authors who, who write in Deseret Book. Like, um, did I write Desert? I really did, didn't I? Well, that's just darn embarrassing. <laughs> Not Desert Book. It's Deseret Book. Um, you know, Deseret Book. Oh, like, yeah. like, for example, if Sister Nelson get, gets up, and, and let me back up a little bit. If Sister Nelson stands up and she's speaking before President Nelson does at a, at a, at a regional conference, is is what she says authoritative? Is it binding? Well, only in so far that she teaches within the bounds of the Holy Ghost. So everybody operates under this principle, except when the president of the church gives binding declarations of the Lord for um, common consent to the church. So does it? Desert Book. Oh my goodness. I'm so embarrassed. We're going to go with it anyway. Desert Book. Um, I'm going to give you an example that's really, really interesting. That should hopefully emphasize what we're talking about. Okay. Teachings of Russell M. Nelson. Very important book, right? Like this book would be considered by 
probably every single member of the church as an authoritative document. It's literally the sermons of the presiding high priest, right? Indeed. Okay. But to the point that we're making, and this is really important to understand. If you open up the front page of it and you look at what is written in the beginning of the teachings of Russell and Nelson, it says this work is not an official publication of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The views expressed herein are the responsibility of the author and do not necessarily represent the position of the church or of Deseret Book Company. This is the this is the book representing the uh. president of the church, President Nelson. If there's any book out there outside of our scriptures that someone would take and say, this is authoritative, it would be this book. And yet, truthfully and rightfully, President Nelson and the church puts this disclaimer on it because even his teachings outside of the authority of the presiding church, he's not speaking as the presiding head of the church in these. He's speaking as someone giving light and truth to the church by virtue of the Holy Ghost and not by way of commandment and revelation. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's really yeah. important. It's really interesting to consider that dimension. Okay, so having said that, let's jump into um, sort of a final point that I want to start to introduce, but we are by all means not going to completely treat this subject because this is going to be the topic of one or two complete video lectures later, okay? And that is the principle of becoming clean from the blood and sins of this generation. So we're going to introduce this, but this, this, is not, this is not the presentation on this principle. So, but we need to bring it up right now because this is tightly connected to the principle of priesthood keys. When someone has a priesthood key that gives them covenantal responsibility to conduct a work or a charge to do something like gather Israel, they are now under covenant to come clean from the blood and sins of the church in the dimension that they were commanded in those keys. And this is why it's very important that we understand how they work, who has them, their covenantal obligation, and how we sustain them because of it. And in DNC 88, this is such a critical, critical section in Revelation. Joseph reveals of the Lord, I give unto you who are the first laborers in this last kingdom a commandment that you assemble yourselves together and organize yourselves and prepare yourselves and sanctify yourselves. Yea, purify your hearts and cleanse your hands and your feet before me that I may make you clean. That I may testify unto your God and your God, your father and your God and my God, that you are clean from the blood of this wicked generation. That I may fulfill this promise, this great and last promise which I have made unto you when I will. That ye may be prepared, I'm jumping to 80, that ye may be prepared in all things when I shall send you again to magnify the calling whereunto I have called you and the mission with which I have commissioned you. We're going to present this now, but talk about this later. That in what we traditionally call the oath and covenant of the priesthood in DNC 84, when it says magnify your calling, that calling is always the same calling, whether you're the president of the church, an apostle, a sick president, a bishop, an elder scorn president, or a father. And that calling is to come clean from the blood and sins of this generation in the dimension, in the office that you're called in. And so when President Nelson and others have priesthood keys, the keys, fulfilling those keys is a key to coming clean from the blood and sins of this generation. Jacob unlocks this for us in the Book of Mormon. Consider this in Jacob 1. And we did magnify our office. So you see the connection there to magnify your calling, right? Especially in DNC 84. Yeah. We did magnify our office unto the Lord, taking upon us the responsibility, answering the sins of the people upon our own heads, if we did not teach them the word of God with all diligence. Wherefore, by laboring with our might, their blood might not come upon our garments. 
Otherwise, their blood would come upon our garments, and we would not be found spotless at the last day. Then he says in the next chapter, again, now my beloved brethren, I, Jacob, according to the responsibility which I am under to God, to magnify mine office with soberness, that I might rid my garments of your sins. I come up into the temple this day, that I might declare unto you the word of God. And ye yourselves know that I have hitherto been diligent in the office of my calling. But I this day am weighed down with much more desire and anxiety for the welfare of your souls than I have hitherto been. The offices of the priesthood and priesthood keys are given for an express purpose for the office holders of the church to magnify redemption into the people. And if they turn those keys and they fulfill the patterns of those keys and they obtain the knowledge that those keys give them rightfully by covenant and they fulfill their priesthood obligation and covenant, they have incredible power to magnify redemption into the church or into a stake or into a ward or into a family. But those keys come with an obligation and a judgment as powerful as the opportunity to magnify righteousness. And that is that if they are not turned or fulfilled, that the blood of the people, of the sins of the people, that they could have blessed or helped, now gets magnified back onto their garments, onto them, that they have to answer in judgment. And that's why priesthood offices and priesthood keys are incredibly important, incredibly powerful. This is why we sustain the president of the church, because he holds all of the keys, and he holds ultimate singular responsibility to magnify these and to teach them with diligence so that he can bless the church to come to the top of the mount. And if he does not, he is in a state of probation that he has to answer for the blood and sins of the people if he doesn't magnify his office in the same way that Jacob is teaching here. And this is why it's very, very important. This role is very, very critical. Well, and can I just, just real quick, Please. and this is, this is a whole different triangle that I'm, that I'm hopping into a little bit here, but I think it ties into all this. And that is in, in DNC 68, I mean, this, this is pretty similar to the reason why the baptism age is, is eight, at least it's, 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 as long as it's explained here, right? And so it says in, in verse 25 there, and as much as parents have children in Zion, or in river stakes, which are organized, that teach them not to understand the doctrine of repentance, faith, baptism, gift of the Holy Ghost, when eight years old, the sin be on the heads of the parents. And so then it said, and their children shall be baptized when they're eight years old. So I, I can, I, and I was just drawing this line of, okay, well, it, the president of the church is kind of like, in, in this instance, kind of like the parents of a child who's getting baptized as eight is, is if they're not teaching their children correct principles, it, as far as I can see, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, it, is that the sin is on the head of the parents. And it, it seems to be saying the same thing about, the presiding high priest of the church in this and just and i again i just wanted to make that quick connection as as i'm as i'm listening to this that was the connection that i that i had made there so that's that's exactly right and and when we talk about baptism we're going to talk about that a lot and we're going to go into that but you're you're so good to, to identify that and bring it up because it's the same principle and and it's a critical one and actually answers a lot of questions regarding uh, baptizing younger children um that that's that opens up a lot when, when you start to see it, it's really, it's, it's a fantastic yeah. principle. Yeah. Again, I feel like it's, it, it can get, you know, pretty far away from what we're talking about here, but I feel like just relating that to it, it could hit a little closer to home by saying, well, you know, parents have this responsibility very similar to the way that, 
you know maybe the the presiding high, high priest is like the parent of of the church in this instance right so anyway yeah thank you i appreciate that because that is exactly the same principle and and so the difference between a parent and the presiding high priest is also how they're called. And this is its own triangle. Mm. We're going to um, talk about this in some other presentations as well, but we're going to introduce it here. And this is something that is, um, I think, really, really probably um, something that we don't ever talk about, but it's it's really straightforward and plain in the scriptures and also in our history. And that is, is how the presiding high priest is called or chosen. Now, everybody knows that they're called because they're the oldest um, ordained apostle, right? The, 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 the senior apostle right. is called as the president of the church. Well, you'll, you'll find no revelation anywhere giving that pattern or that principle laid out. That's not a, a revealed pattern given to us. Now, that doesn't mean it's wrong, though, because the principle is, as we find in 107, that of the Melchizedek priesthood, three presiding high priests chosen by the body, appointed and ordained to that office and upheld by the confidence, faith, and prayer of the church form a quorum of the presidency of the church or the first presidency. So the principle of the presiding high priest is that the church or the priesthood bodies of the church choose and appoint the first presidency and the presiding high priest. So the way that we fulfill this obligation for us to appoint someone is that we just develop this pattern and we stick to it. At a couple of different times in church history, the brethren have debated not using that pattern and doing something different, which is really, really interesting. I don't think a lot of people know that. Um, but the pattern that we use of the, of the oldest apostle becoming the the, the president of the church is just the way that we appoint them. And it's important to know though, that we do appoint them to those offices that it's chosen by the body, because if we understand that principle, and we can start to understand the depth of responsibility that we have as a covenant people to both sustain them and to discern them. It's really, really important to know that principle. President Joseph F. Smith really sort of puts a big ex, um, exclamation mark behind this. The charge that the church shuns enlightened investigation is contrary to reason and fact. Enlightened investigation is the very means through which the church hopes to promote belief in her principles and extend the, benefit, uh, the, the beneficent influence of her institutions. From the beginning, enlightened investigation has been the one thing she has sought. The ecclesiastical government itself exists by the will of the people. Isn't that interesting? Mm. So, so the, the ecclesiastical leadership structure of the church exists by the will of the people. Elections are frequent. Now, we don't call them elections now. We, we sustain them, right? But sustaining Correct. is essentially an election. And the mm. members are at liberty to vote as they choose. The church officers in the exercise of their functions are answerable to the church. No officer, however exalted his position, is exempt from this law. Even the president, its highest officer, is subject to these laws and special provision is made for his trial and, if necessary, his deposition. So he's referring to DNC 107 when 107 actually gives us the, the, the model that if the president of the church is in sin, how we can remove him as the president of the church. The principle here that's being introduced is that the people appoint and sustain through election the officers who are there covenanting to uphold. And that is a really important thing because what it does is it puts responsibility back on the church to answer for the way that we both appoint officers and how we sustain them. This topic requires a dedication of an entire, you know, video, or we'll and we'll go through it um, soon. But it needs to be laid out here because when we talk about priesthood keys, we have a covenantal responsibility 
to support and sustain those that we appoint to the presiding high priest of the church, to the first presidency, and those in the apostleship who are called. We are in covenant with them, not necessarily just to do whatever they tell us, which we should do if those are if those if those directions are given by the power of the Holy Ghost, but also to sustain them in every dimension and be, by being accountable to our decisions. And so it's really, really important that we understand this principle. So we're outlining it here, we're laying it out. Um, this is to the furthest extent I'm actually going to do it at this point, but we want to start to introduce this idea so that we can understand how to sustain priesthood keys. Because I believe, even though we in the church talk a lot about sustaining the prophet and sustaining apostles and the leadership and the bishop and the stake president, I actually don't think we sustain them very well, even though that seems to be the one thing that we are most confident about. <laughs> and unless we understand that we're in a mutual a mutually accountable covenant with each other to come clean from the blood and sins of this generation. We don't really sustain them in the full way that would help them and bless them in coming clean from the blood and sins of this generation. And so our next video that we're going to, we're going to produce tomorrow uh, is going to be about how we sustain the brethren and how we sustain the leadership of the church. And it's going to be very, very important. And I'm very excited about it because I think we can sustain them so much more than we do now. And so many of the problems that we have in the church is because we don't sustain them because we don't know how, because it's not clear what those principles actually are. And so that's the conclusion of this presentation. Awesome. Any thoughts or questions in, in, at the end? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot to dig into, but I feel like it's going to be a, a lot of my stuff that, that any thoughts that I have is going to be addressed in these future ones. As, as you've talked about, I mean, you've, you've prefaced it with, well, this will be talked about later. This will be talked about later. So I'm like, all right, cool, cool. Yeah. So, so we're, yeah, we're introducing we'll a lot of principles and I, and I know it's annoying. I keep saying we're going to talk about this later, but we are, th these are so important. They're so critical that as we go through these, I am so confident that as people digest them in the spirit in which they're intended, that we will become a people that will sustain revealed leadership, that we will sustain those who hold these keys that are, we've appointed to these offices to do in a very, very important work. And if we don't sustain them in the right ways, we're doing them a dis service and we're breaking a covenant i believe and so it's my desire that people become more faithful to the church and more faithful to these principles and more faithful to the priesthood governance structure that has the capacity to be an incredible blessing even more than we feel now and so i look forward to talking about this more me too, Todd. I love it. Thanks, brother. Talk to you soon. All right. See you.